Good evening. I'm Dr. Patrick Lewis, Director of Collections and Research at the Pilsen Historical Society, and we're so glad that you joined us virtually for tonight's lecture. Thank you again for joining us virtually for Crowdsourcing Early America, which is presented with the support of the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of our Resurrecting the First American West project. Please join me in welcoming two longtime friends and collaborators of mine, Sarah and Ben Brumfield, for tonight's presentation. Sarah Brumfield is a software engineer and entrepreneur. She co-founded From the Page, a crowdsourced transcription platform that allows institutions to share documents for transcription. Prior to founding From the Page, she spent 17 years as a software engineer with IBM, inventing or co-inventing eight patents. She has a BA in computer science and the study of women and gender from Rice University. Ben Brumfield is a partner at Brumfield Labs, a software consultancy specializing in crowdsourcing and digital editions. In 2005, he and Sarah began developing one of the first web-based manuscript transcription systems, which was released as From the Page. It has been used by libraries, museums, and universities to transcribe the literary drafts, military diaries, herpetology field notes, and punk rock fanzines, and some early American documents that we're going to talk about tonight. Ben has written and presented on crowdsourced manuscript transcription uh, for over a decade. He received a BA in computer science and linguistics from Rice University. Um, I'll uh, return to moderate questions. Uh, ben and Sarah and I are gonna uh, share this one and show a lot of examples of work that um, they have ongoing from the page and that we have ongoing here at the Filson. If you do have questions for us at any time, please drop them in the chat and I'll make sure that they uh, get asked. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Sarah and Ben Brumfield. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, kick off and uh, and share a little bit of what led us to start this uh, this first American West uh, project. I'm going to share my screen here in just a second. The Filson was uh, very early in the, uh, the the world of digital humanities and uh, and American history archives, uh, starting in the, the late 1990s and debuting in the early 2000s. Uh, we participated in a really uh, forward looking project called the First American West, the Ohio River Valley 1750 to 1820. Um, this was a project that was supported and hosted by the Library of Congress and uh, digitized content from both the Filson and the University of Chicago. Of course, those of you who know your Filson history will know why uh, the Filson and the University of Chicago paired up uh, on this because the, the University of Chicago bought uh, Ruben Durrett, uh, the Filson founder's uh, private library from him towards the end of his life. And so what had been the greatest single collection of uh, Kentucky history and material focused on this era uh, of uh, settlement, exploration, colonization, and statehood um, traveled up to the University of Chicago, where it could have access to uh, these newfangled things called uh, PhD programs and grad students. Um, and so the Filson had to begin uh, again in the, uh, the 1920s to rebuild um, the world-class collection that it now has. So the project here was imagined as a reuniting uh, of uh, Durrett's content with what the Filson had acquired over the past uh, 80 years um, of collecting since uh, since the, the rebuilding efforts began. And this project uh, not only was meant to provide, you know, access to some really incredible and valuable uh, maps, manuscripts, rare books, uh, portraits, and, and 3D objects, uh, but also to really sort of think through at a large scale what, uh, what digitization needed to look like uh, for libraries and archives. Um, we can see, though, the problem with all of this because I have up a, a rendering from archive.org, which is almost all uh, that exists uh, from the uh, the first American West uh, project. Now, this was taken down in 2016, uh, and uh, and now has has next to no functional presence uh, on the web. The the technology underlying 
the, the presentation site was uh, too old to sustain and, and LOC decided to take it down. Uh, they shipped the files back to the Filson and back to the University of Chicago and said, you know, you're the rights holders to this, um, you know, do something with this if you can. Um, but we can't support this, uh, this site anymore. And so the Filson sat on that for a long time. And uh, when the, uh, the, the, the demand for digital documents really spiked in 2020, uh, especially in that spring when, uh, you know, classes were, were closing and students were going home into quarantine and there was this desperate need for any sort of digitized content, the Filson was left in a really odd position. Um, you know, and we were seeing demand from our, you know, our school, our K-12 and our, uh, our undergraduate education partners who really wanted access to these materials here, which are the heart of the Filson's manuscript collection, the heart of, of its, its sort of scholarly operation um, in this era. And uh, we didn't have any easily accessible way for them to, to go about that based on the strength of having already digitized uh, this material nearly 20 years before, the Filson had focused since then um, in its digital efforts on making 20th century content available. And while we had a lot of that to share, we weren't able to help um, those classes that were focusing on the earlier part of American history and, and really share what was the heart of our collection. So that presented a problem for us. Uh, and so when some funding opportunities came up as a result of some of the, uh, the, the pandemic uh, relief bills that passed through Congress, uh, we were able to secure some funding through the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, to resurrect um, this, uh, this site. Uh, I did want to go through this here because I do find it very interesting. There's still lots of really functional uh, and informative material here in this uh, in this Wayback Machine rendering, uh, and also some things that are still on the Library of Congress website that we've discovered in the course of, of doing this project, actually. Um, so I did want to make everyone aware of what does exist here, uh, in case you did want to, uh, to poke around and see this. Um, and I, I call this the boneyard because we see our uh, our friend uh, the uh, the skeleton here from presumably from Big Bone Lick, um, which was a major archaeological discovery, our paleontological discovery uh, in early Kentucky. Um, this is the the landing page that you would have gone to on the the Library of Congress website, which has lots of really excellent introductory uh, material here. You can see. Uh, there are a number of ways to sort of get into this. You can just throw in keyword searches. You could just throw keyword searches at it. There is also a really uh, substantive uh, subject index uh, as well. Um, if you clicked on any of these, uh, these underlined subject terms here, it would take you uh, to, uh, you know, I clicked on Native Americans earlier. I'm switching over to this other tab. It will pull up any of these that had been tagged um, with content relevant to Native Americans. But the problem here is you click on any one of these and it's a dead link. So um, that means that while a lot of the, the sort of what we would call the front matter, right? The, th the introduction, the index, the, uh, the sort of the descriptive, uh, you know, um, material that lets you use this collection of digitized documents uh, is still up here. You can't actually use the stuff itself. There is, however, some really fascinating things here. This building the collection link, I really want to point people to because I know this is a question that we often receive at the Filson uh, from, you know, from other uh, libraries, archives, and cultural institutions who are thinking about large-scale digitization projects, and then also thinking about some of the presentations that uh, our curatorial colleagues thinking about Danielle Spolinka had a really excellent presentation this summer about um, the planning that you should go through before you hit scan on your family archive, right? If you're thinking about scanning uh, some family letters or, or photos or what have you, all of that digital planning, uh, that, that deciding about file type and resolution and organization and structure um, that you need to do, there's a lot of that that this project was meant to uh, help other organizations think through at this time uh, when more and more of this scanning technology was available. The internet was was sort of being seen as a new uh, access frontier for 
uh, for cultural organizations like the Filson. And so they wanted to make all of these, uh, these data standards uh, very publicly accessible, right? So for each of the different uh, document types here, books and pamphlets, manuscripts and broadsides, maps and prints. Uh, they go through and give you all of the uh, the color and resolution settings that they use. These are still essentially what we are scanning at today, this sort of established an archival standard that more or less uh, places are still using um, in the past. Uh, very relevant to what we'll be talking about uh, tonight, they listed their, their transcription standards, um, how they dealt with the inconsistencies and the quirks of late 18th and early 19th century manuscripts and handwritings, um, especially those that might not have been in English or those who had uh, had incomplete um, education. And then they talked a little bit about uh, intellectual access to the collections. And that's, again, thinking about all the different ways, whether that's uh, a keyword search, a date search, a subject term search, all the different ways that you could um, get into this data. So all of this is here on, on archive.org and well worth exploring uh, if you want to better understand our collection, um, what we will be putting up uh, later on this year, uh, or you, you're thinking about using these data standards as something that you could do for yourself. Um, in the context of doing this, uh, this project to resurrect these, uh, these documents and put them back online after they had been taken down, um, Jim Holmberg, our, uh, our curator, um, was, uh, was doing some searches for, he was trying to find new documents that we could use to supplement the original selections. Uh, that we had put up here 20 years ago. Um, and in searching for some documents that he knew we had um, in, uh, in our uh, collections, he stumbled upon this directory, which still lives on the Library of Congress uh, server. You can't get to it anywhere, but it's sort of the, it's sort of the missing link um, here between what we see on that archive.org rendering and, and the, the, the files that we got that actually make that site run, that make those documents viewable. Um, you know, uh, without getting into the, the file naming schemes here, uh, each repository and document type was given a, a different tag. Um, and, and we can just sort of see the, all of the different documents, the thousands upon thousands of documents and images uh, that were put up here um, that, that all got pulled into that database. And you can still sort of click on these and, and there's a very tiny, I think that's a town plot of Lexington um, right there. Um, I pulled one thing that I know is a Filson document um, from having compared this to the, the, the metadata spreadsheets that we received here. Um, and you can see there, uh, a letter from Levi Wells to Isaac Guathme, um, and then that's its code. Uh, manuscript Filson um, 0001 was the, the first thing that they identified uh, in there, and you can still see, and I don't know how I feel about this from a, uh, a data protection uh, point of view, but you can still see the access copy of that uh, image is still up there. Um, so there are still some remnants here um, if you're if you're brave enough to wade into uh, the the digital ruins of the first American West um, to go poke around in, obviously that's not something that we expect just anyone to do. We want to provide a much better uh, research uh, experience for our users, um, especially those who will be encountering the Filson for the first time, encountering this content for the first time, thinking especially about um, audiences for whom, and thinking about kids who are not, you know, not taught cursive today, for whom this is 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 challenging, um, and uh, and and essentially uh, unusable. And so, as we thought about planning this project to, as we call, resurrect the first American West. Um, we, I thought about um, uh, Ben and Sarah Brumfield, who uh, have worked with me uh, for years before I came to the Filson on on uh, transcription and other uh, digital humanities projects. And uh, I'm going to hand off to them and let them uh, sort of walk through uh, from the page some of the other projects that uh, that have been going on. Uh, using that site and and then how the Filson uh, will bring back around to how the Filson is going to use that technology. Wow. Right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, good evening, everyone. I've got to say this is a, a very challenging act to, to follow because as a technologist, uh, it's always humbling to see how fragile 
how fragile digital sites can be, um, especially ones that we built before we really started thinking about sustainability. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. So Sarah and I would like to take you on a bit of a tour of the, the projects that we host on our From the Page platform that bracket the first American West. So we're gonna be moving chronologically and geographically uh, kind of around the first American West project. Uh, so we'd like to start and, and do this by way of sort of introducing the platform um, and the project by talking about a set of documents that are we host for Harvard University Libraries, uh, which during the pandemic posted a large number of its colonial North America holdings on from the page and had both volunteers and staff, the public, uh, work on transcribing these. Um, so this is just kind of the homepage for the, the Houghton Library's colonial collections. And if we click on one of these, um, we can find that this is the journal of uh, Thomas Hubbard in 17... 11 through 1713 in their expedition against Canada. And what I'd like to do is uh, let's click through and see one of these. All right. So what does this actually look like? This is the Journal of an Expedition Against Canada. Uh, it's awfully difficult to read, um, but people have been able to do that. And, um, you know, they are the, the system relies on humans. It relies on scholars on amateurs and on amateur scholars um, to transcribe these documents. So really all people have been doing here is reading as best they can, the comments over you know, the, the text from the image and then typing what they see here. One um, of the cool things about from the page is we have this very, um, this model called collaborative knowledge creation, which means you know Ben might come in and transcribe this page, but then I could come back an hour later, a day later, a year later, and edit it, make updates. Maybe I can read something he wasn't able to read. And so in that way, we can kind of collaborate and together we're smarter than any of us individually. Right, because there's always a chance someone else is going to come through and spot a mistake and, uh, and add this later, right? And uh, this Harvard project has been configured with transcription tips. So they explain exactly the rules that they are asking people to follow. Very similar to what Patrick showed us from the um, the, the Wayback Machine on the right. what were the transcription conventions that they used when they were transcribing that material. So let's take a look at another project that uh, we host for Harvard. This is at the Baker Library. Um, and which is actually their business library, which is kind of interesting. Right, right. <laughs> so what kind of historic material do you find at a business library? Well, one of the most interesting things that, that they have, at least in my opinion, are the Hancock family papers. Um, so this is a letter book of business documents that are written by John Hancock and his correspondence with other people um, from roughly 1712 to 1854. And in this case, we're taking a look at material that's um, 1764, uh, I guess. Um, and one of the things that we were blown away by when we first encountered this material. Uh, we started reading it. We said, wow, this guy's handwriting is amazing. It's so clear. Well, of course, that's John mm -hmm. Hancock for you. <laughs> yes. um, so one of the really interesting things about this Colonial North America project at Harvard is how they organized it. So you'll see starting here, Colonial North America Baker Library, and then we get the Botany Library. So every one of their repositories, their different libraries, um, went and looked for their special collections material that came from the colonial period. And then they've organized it here. So if you're interested in historical scientific instruments, well, there happens to be a collection very specifically about that if you're interested in medicine. So it kind of, it, it crosses a lot of different subject matters and it's organized kind of thematically um, based on that subject matter because each library had different material. And I think there's some parallels here with um, what Patrick was talking about in the early, that, that very first, first American West project of bringing material from multiple institutions together into an online exhibit. This, this idea of bringing thematic material together uh, where people who are interested can actually look at it. 
Uh, the next project we want to talk about is a little bit further west. So this is the Native Bound Unbound project, um, which seeks to discover cases of indigenous slavery. So um, those of us from the American South were very familiar with race-based slavery and, and that kind of history. Uh, we may be a little bit less familiar with the enslavement of American Indians and indigenous peoples further west, particularly by the Spanish in Spanish North America. And this is out of New Mexico, right? Yes. This, okay. Yes. Right. So these documents are still American, but the documents are mostly in Spanish. Um, and the, what they are trying to do is document any instance in these early, mostly church records of the mention of enslaved people so that they're going to form a database of the indigenous enslaved and their relationships to each other. But in order to do that, they're transcribing all the documents. So one of the things that I think is really interesting here is that they are transcribing these documents and pointing out any time they mention uh, someone who is uh, indigenous. So um, there's even commentary here talking about how there are Pawnees in the record. Um, and you see a good example here. Um, yeah, the, was it Padrino? No. No, okay, right. Mm -hmm. So there is Ap Apache is yes. right there. All right. So we've got, yeah, Alberta of the nation Apache, right, for example. Um, and the Pawnee is a little bit harder for me to find. Um, it's right there, nation Pawnee. It's like it crosses a line, which is part of the problem. Ah, okay. Nation, nation. Yeah, Panana, so Pawnee. So they are recording all of these people and tribal affili affiliations um, and trying to get insight into that understudied period of slavery in North America. One of the interesting things um, about from the page is not only do people transcribe and kind of collaborate to transcribe, but we have this notes and questions area at the bottom. And in this particular page from the Native Bound Unbound Project, uh, you see one of their transcriber volunteers asking, you know, what is the meaning of this word in Zuela? Um, and the project leads, the academics are like that Zuela ending is diminutive, like it's little, right? It's, um, but it is probably in this case, it's demeaning. And that's kind of useful to know kind of how the text is being written and how the writer is perceiving the people they're talking about. And it's really important in this case, right? Even though, and we've discussed this with a, a librarian who has a, a she's, Hispanic um, and is native Spanish speaker. And she says, oh, you know, that's an ethnic slur, right? You wouldn't call someone that nowadays. What do you do about that? And, and it's really important, especially in this case, to preserve these because ethnic slurs in these documents are often how you discover the enslaved people being mentioned and how you find out that they appear. So moving a little bit further afield and a little bit further, uh, a little closer to Kentucky. Um, this is a project at the Indiana State Archives that is transcribing the Jeffersonville Land Office receipt books. Um, so these span a very similar per uh, period to the first American West project, and they are right across the Ohio River. I mean, it would not surprise me if there was quite a bit of crossover uh, between these two. Uh, these documents are a little bit different in format because these are ledger books. And so the Indiana State Archives have asked uh, volunteers to transcribe some very specific things, month, day, year. They're asking those to be kind of broken out and interpreted by the people doing the transcription. Uh, similarly, they're asking people to interpret first name and last name. Um, but they're not asking for absolutely everything to be interpreted because their goal is to create an online index so that people can find these records. And some of the information discussed may not be that useful. Um, speaking of the people who are mentioned, uh, you know, you see C and T bullet. Uh, Patrick and, mm -hmm. and the rest of you probably have a better idea of whether this is connected to the bullet family. But um, hey, they're from Louisville, Kentucky. So right, right. you all so know that's probably they some connection. And so it's neat to see that even in out-of-state archives, you see material about Kentuckians. Right. One of the interesting things that we found on from the page is these connections, they happen everywhere. So um, our very first uh, scientific transcription project was 
uh, the field notes of Joseph Grinnell, who was a herpetologist. Um, actually, Grinnell was not a herpetologist. Grinnell was an ornithologist. And this is our second uh, scientific field book project. But if you uh, look in the first line here, Clauber is an amateur herpetologist. That actually is a mention of a herpetologist whose papers were also transcribed on from the page. And um, if you scroll down to the comments, I actually think I added something. Uh, I had a link to the Clauber field notes, which are no longer online here. And it says we could see where Clauber was talking about Grinnell. And so the fact that you have these two documents that are in dialogue with each other that you wouldn't necessarily know unless you transcribed things. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of idea of serendipity is one of the things that we we hope these these kind of cross document projects like the first American West are able to find and enable. Um, so back to examples uh, this uh, of out of state documents that mention Kentuckians. Uh, this is the Missouri State Archives and their county tax lists. Uh, so a lot of these counties were settled by people. Uh, from Kentucky. So you've got Boone County and Clay County. Um, and so, you know, there's a good chance that, um, you know, if we were to transcribe these pages, we might find people with familiar names who appear in these other documents. Let's see, we can even scan through something that's been transcribed um, in the Boone County example. So I don't actually see anyone that I recognize, but you're so not a fine. Kentuckian. Right. So moving a little bit farther forward in time, um, one of the projects that we wanted to talk about as well is the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi project. So this is a collaboration between historians at the University of Southern Mississippi and the Mississippi Digital Library to scan, transcribe, and annotate uh, all the correspondence with the officer of the governor from the very beginning of the Civil War and the, in fact the secession crisis, all the way through Reconstruction and the end of Reconstruction and the imposition of Jim Crow under the, the Redeemers. Um, and so the things that they're working on, uh, you know, these are these are letters. They're very, some of them are actually very, very clear. Um, as people transcribe these letters, the project team has been following behind the volunteers and doing annotations of uh, these names like M.R. Spivey. Uh, one of the things I think is really interesting about this that I only learned last week is that the project team is composed mainly of graduate students and undergraduates um, who are probably in their, their 20s or early 30s. And that while they are great at doing the research of figuring out who M.R. Spivey might be, they also have a lot of trouble reading the handwriting. And so this project really relies on the expertise of volunteers who are older, who have a deeper background in cursive to provide that expertise. And then the people who are using these online databases to do this research later, it's this, it's this real collaborative effort. Um, and they are actually moving slowly to their reconstruction era and need more volunteers. So yes, if you right. are interested in Mississippi history, <laughs> probably should mention that because Patrick needs you to volunteer on his project. Um, so as the material is transcribed and then annotated, it's added to their digital edition. So this is the uh, CWRGM, the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi, CWRGM.org, um, which is a beautiful site. Right. So every document that they transcribed, they've pulled into this site, which is a totally separate kind of technical entity. And every every um, person, place, or thing that they've tagged in that transcription um, shows up in their indexes. So here we have an index of uh, Kentucky mentions, and you can see the very, so scroll back yeah, there's like a 735 documents. letters or documents that mention Kentucky in this collection. Um, so we pulled one out to look at, and you can see in here not only the transcription and the original document, but every entity that's been tagged, you could click on and see every other time that, say, Pettis, Governor Pettis is mentioned or Governor McGuffin is mentioned um, in other documents. And we're all familiar with Pettis in Mississippi from both the Civil War and then uh, the bridge named after him, the, the Civil Rights Era. Um, but Kentuckians may also be familiar with Beriah McGuffin, the governor of, of Kentucky, who is mentioned here 
um, by someone who is arguing about secession uh, among these southern states in this period. A Buckner, actually. <laughs> yes, a, uh, yes, a Buckner, who is probably I think also a name Kentucky. you would probably recognize. Yeah. So uh, with that, we'd like to turn things back over to Patrick uh, to talk about the resurrecting the first American West. On from the page. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, you all, and and you all know I'm always keen to to see a Buckner um, pop up, <laughs> um, and especially to to think about the ways that Kentucky connections into the Southwest influence the secession crisis. Next book, it's a preview. Um, it's coming and whenever I get that research done, it's going to be a while. Um, but, you know, I, I think that and I really appreciate what you all showed um, in the other documents uh, from, you know, states other than Kentucky and thinking about as close as just across the river from Louisville, but thinking about the ways that that Mississippi and Missouri play into this story of Kentucky history. Of course, that's been the, the Filson's uh, focus is not just studying uh, Kentucky, but but using this this Ohio Valley lens to really capture all of the ways that that people connect uh, across one another. And, the, and again, this is this is one of the, the great ideas that started the Durick collection that that was the, the nucleus of the first American West, both at the University of Chicago and then uh, the, the Filson collections afterwards. But I think really will um, uh, makes, uh, makes us want to um, to get this content up and digitally accessible again, because again, the, the discoverability and the, uh, the ability to link these materials um, now is, is so much greater perhaps than it has been before. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again and talk about uh, the work that we have done uh, starting this summer that is now accessible on um, the, uh, the Filsons uh, from the page uh, profile. Anyone who uh, wants to can create a from the page account and uh, and transcribe the materials that we put up, or in fact that any of these projects um, have put up. Um, you know, uh, you can click here on the find a project uh, tab and and really just sort of scroll through and see all of the really incredible things uh, that folks have up here. But I did just want to give you sort of a a, a quick sort of. Uh, look into all of the, the different types of materials that we have. What we have put up so far are the original uh, selections that the Filson contributed to the first First American West site. So these are the things that we chose 20 years ago from our collections to scan and then put up at the Library of Congress. Um, it's not everything that we put up at that time. We chose not to do anything with um, what was actually a pretty substantial collection of uh, rare books and pamphlets that were in our library collection. Um, those uh, had been um, scanned and most of them were transcribed. They were sent out to an outside vendor at the time uh, who, who had some, some folks do the, the transcription uh, of that printed text um, and put and make all of those uh, uh, books and pamphlets keyword searchable. Now, most of those are on Google Books or HathiTrust or, or some other site. Um, and so we decided not to um, to expend the bandwidth and the staff time to put those things back up there, though we will be making records that, that those were in the original um, selection of documents and then probably providing some links that you can go and read those books um, elsewhere if you wanted to. There were still some printed materials. You can see this notices of Kentucky uh, and Lexington from 1828, some printed things that um, have not ended up um, in some of those uh, those more publicly accessible sites, mostly because probably the Filson has one of the only copies um, of these sorts of things. But you can tell here we've gone from uh, Caroline Hancock Preston's um, recipes, uh, some uh, questions about the Burr conspiracy, um, newspapers and pamphlets received at the post office in Lexington, uh, broadsides and military documents, um, land auctions in, uh, in Owensboro, uh, and some really fantastic uh, uh, broadsides for those interested in the history of music, culture, and then also visual culture of these, these early engravings. And we, of course, have the, the famous alligator horse of the Hunters of Kentucky as our, uh, our project cover. Uh, I'll flip over to the statistics tab so that you can see uh, kind of what we have uh, up here so far. Um, 
we've put up 90 works, uh, made them available for transcription. Um, that's a total of about 523 pages. Uh, and, uh, and of that, we still have 265 pages that are incomplete. So um, of this, we have about half of that work has been done so far. So definitely need volunteers uh, to jump in and help us out with this. And then we can sort of see the, the role of honor uh, of folks who have spent their time, uh, you know, um, uh, volunteering on this uh, these transcription projects here for us. Um, but I wanted to go back and, and start from uh, this uh, Library of Congress directory uh, where we saw this letter earlier um, and we could look back here and see the uh, the original metadata, this letter from Levi Wells to Isaac Guathme. Um, and I wanted to, to show you all what this looks like now uh, on the uh, First American uh, West from the Page um, site. Levi Wells, Isaac Guathme. You can tell we've already got a little bit more description. So one of the things that our project team has been doing now is going back and providing a little bit more short description, whether that comes out of our, uh, our manuscript database or whether they're generating that themselves. And then these things look exactly like the other projects that, uh, that Ben and Sarah showed us, um, though that one zoomed in a whole lot. There we are. So that's the same image that we saw. Uh, on the uh, the Library of Congress directory. One of the things that we were really excited about when we got all these files and really started poking around once we understood that naming structure, um, we could uh, sort of reassociate those images. And because those data standards that they were using 20 years ago are still more or less what we use today, we did not have to rescan very many things. There are some exceptions, some of the really large stuff, especially maps, um, we did decide to make new images of because that large format uh, image Imaging is, is a little bit better today. But for things that you can throw on a flatbed scanner, um, we're basically reusing those files. And so we've really only started to do uh, massive scanning of the new things that we have decided to, uh, to add to this. And you can see now we've got a uh, pretty solid transcription uh, of this page. Um, and But uh, hopefully your your little antenna went off and said, I know what word that is in the brackets with the question mark, because it was obviously, I, I would say, Piro. Um, they were building. Oh, purpose, yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah, no, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And and you, somebody should go fix that because somebody right. knows, <laughs> right? Maybe not me, but you do. <laughs> so that's the sort of the fun of this, right? Is yeah. to be like, oh, I can help with this, right? Sorry to interrupt you, Patrick. But <laughs> no, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, so thinking about some of the selections that we we have made, we've got another 200 documents that we are uh, re, uh, that we are imaging now for the first time and are going to be uploading here um, onto from the page um, in the next couple of weeks uh, and let folks um, start to transcribe on that. Uh, those are some, you know, some documents that come out of uh, some manuscript collections that we have cataloged since those initial selections were made. Uh, some things that came in the door after that. Also some things that didn't make the first cut. Um, we've decided to, to try to look intentionally uh, for the voices of marginalized peoples, especially women, enslaved people, um, indigenous actors where we can find them. Um, we're doing that not only through manuscripts, but also through a, a more thorough review of our portrait and object collection as well, uh, and placing those uh, up and making them available for, uh, for teaching, learning, and sharing. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and, um, and we can sort of uh, go into Q&A mode for everyone uh, watching in the chat. Um, uh, please do get your questions in there. Um, I wanted to, you know, while we get some questions in, um, I wanted to ask you all, I love the the from the page origin story, and I don't think we we went back there uh, and touched on that. So uh, how did you all come up with this idea and, and what motivated it? I think the short answer is when you're a software engineer, then build it, then, then hammers are easier than doing the actual work, right? Yeah. So th this all started actually as a, a family history project that my great great grandmother, who grew up in Virginia on a tobacco farm, uh, had left diaries that were kind of uh, scattered to the four winds and my family inherited two. Uh, my father was able to transcribe one of them and share them with his relatives and 
they became kind of this hit whenever we'd go to the small town that, that the family is from. Uh, you'd have uh, little old ladies come up to you and say, um, oh, I was just reading that diary and uh, you know, I, I, whenever I feel down, I, I read one of those diary entries and I read this 80 year old woman getting up and feeding the chickens and making dinner and then just stitching a quilt and, and say, well, if she can do that, I can get through my day. Um, so I decided I was going to, to transcribe and print up the second diary. And uh, it turns out that transcribing handwritten text is really hard, especially if you don't know anything about tobacco agriculture or the people who were involved. Um, so it was a lot easier to try to build a collaborative system where other people, including other members of my family, but other people I didn't know at all, could come in and help with that effort. And the, the idea of many hands making light work um, would get this done. And in fact, that was successful. We even discovered six more diaries that came in from uh, other people. Um, and then after that, of course, we had a tool that could be used by, by anyone. We've got a really fantastic question in the chat um, from someone who's participating in one of the Library of Congress uh, crowdsourcing projects and, and sort of wondering about uh, subject tagging um, and saying that, that LSC doesn't give specific uh, parameters for what they want tagged. Uh, and this is something that, of course, you all threw from the page, sort of give your project designers the, the freedom to, to do. What are some of the different ways that different projects are capturing information? And, and what are some of the, the, the benefits and trade-offs that you get from each of those different systems? I'm going to start with the second, the benefits and trade-offs. One of the things that we often tell um, kind of the people who run projects is to think about where the material goes in the end, because uh, we really, it, it kind of hurts my soul to ask volunteers to do things that get thrown away. And it's, you would be surprised at how much of this sort of digital online work the systems that are further downstream don't have places for. Um, so a lot of um, our projects are pure text transcription because that is really all the downstream systems have have places for but pure text transcription gives you full text search and you can find names and mentions of events and places and that's that is a, a humongous advantage uh, in their systems yeah, other projects you know really run the spectrum the mississippi project asked the public to just transcribe the plain text then they have their staff members doing the kind of research and annotation uh that that glenn is talking about mm -hmm. um but there are projects that do involve volunteers and in doing all that research right that do ask people to go research um you know any of these entities, right? The people or places that are found. And the ornithology example that Sarah showed earlier was a good one. Um, that's one in which you have people who are uh, modern scientists, right? Modern ornithologists who are looking at uh, historic documents of these expeditions um, to different places in, in this case, California, hoping to recreate the landscape as it was when those naturalists went and looked 100 years ago. So they're asking people not only to transcribe the text, but also to mark up the people and the places, yes, but also the species that are mentioned, right? The, the species, not just of the birds the ornithologist observes, but also of the trees, of the, the lizards, of the things the birds might be eating. Um, and so what they can do with that once they have that is that they can go on a similar expedition and follow the exact route of that ornithologist and compare their observations with the observations 100 years ago to find out how the climate has changed because of you know well, sprawl how species or, have changed yes yeah, yeah how how the natural world has changed over that those 100 years you know that that really resonates with me as as our viewers uh, will recognize I'm not in my normal broadcasting locations but in fact in a hotel room in Charlottesville Virginia um but the reason that I'm here is because there's a, a consortium of folks um that UVA has pulled together that's looking at how they can aggregate historical weather records into some sort of usable research database and of course they're starting from Thomas Jefferson's you know very enlightenment very scientific records that you know have precise measurements. He's got good scientific instruments. And one of the things that I'm bringing 
uh, from the Filson is, you know, sort of large samples of weather data um, in all of its various forms pulled from across our manuscript collections, right, from folks maybe, you know, I pulled, for example, two instances of uh, uh, Shaker weather records from Pleasant Hill, um, one from 1816 before they have a thermometer, right, where everything is descriptive, um, and then one from 1864 where they not only have one thermometer, they have, you know, three scattered all across their properties in different locations and, and in relationship to the river um, so that they can take very precise um, temperature measurements so that they can sort of do all the scientific farming that they're really excellent at. But one of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, um, all of this peripheral information here, you know, we think about weather as, as you know, a temperature and is it raining or snowing or not. Um, but there is so much rich context in there, right? And so how, um, and those are the questions that I'm going to ask um, these folks tomorrow, right? But, but it, it, these are the things that relate sort of across these collections. You have to think through um, the restrictions of the, the source material that you're working with, but then also, um, imagining what those potential researchers will want out of this thing. That's that's tough to do at the outset of a project. <laughs> yes. Well, and I think, you know, so we're seeing, um, so a lot of the spreadsheet style projects that we showed a couple of the Jeffersonville land office and we showed another one, Missouri something. Yeah. Um, those are often going, you know, back into digital asset management systems and are useful for search uh, and and things like that. But like the Library of Virginia in particular, they they take their stuff and move it two different ways. They do the first, and then they also create data sets and they upload them to the Virginia Data the Portal, Open Data, portal, open data yes. portal that they run. And so they're they're pushing to make data sets available to researchers. I think researchers are still learning how to do useful things with that, but that's that's the next thing. That's like, that's what's coming. That's what uh, we talked to, you know, humanities uh, schools and, and, and that's where a lot of the data science focus is going there is how do we teach students how to have data literacy and use these historic data sets. Because this data can be used for, for more than one purpose. There was a early digital humanities and genealogy project I worked on transcribing uh, parish registers from the UK, specifically from you know 1500 up to 1930, it's 1830-ish. Uh, so these are very early records. And we were contacted by a public health researcher who was trying to figure out what the impact of Icelandic volcanoes was on these northern, remote northern counties in the UK that were directly in the path of, of this, you know, volcanic smoke. And this data set, the record of all of the baptisms, well, those represent births, all the burials, well, those represent deaths, and being able to analyze that for one locality over time uh, was what they needed to figure out what the effects of Icelandic volcanoes right now might be in addition to just messing up air traffic. One of the things that um, has always impressed me about what you do, and it relates to something that Sarah mentioned earlier about not wanting to ask volunteers to, to do work that isn't going anywhere, right? And it gets to this, this question of, of project design, right? But one of the things that I, I really appreciate is that you all, um, have have sort of become uh, experts and advocates and a resource for you know for organizations who want to build a base of transcribers uh, and to to maintain contact with these people who may not otherwise be involved in your organization, right? Um, what are some of the the things that you think are are critical to a successful crowdsourcing project? Um, so we actually do a pretty regular webinar where we work on teaching organizations how to run successful crowdsourcing projects. And we talk a lot about relationship building, right? Um, so when someone joins your project and, and transcribes their first page, you know, you should send them a welcome email and you should explain the, the purpose of this work, right? Because we all want kind of meaningful volunteer work. We don't want it just going out into a void and, and we don't know whether anybody cares or not. Um, similarly, you know, we, we saw those notes and comments sections on a page. You know, if you, if you leave a note or a question, the organization 
has an obligation to respond to you. If they're, if they're asking you to do this labor and you're like, okay, well, do I do it this way or this way? Or, oh, look, this, this is really interesting. Um, I think, you know, we really encourage our project owners. We send them a nightly email that says, here's all the interesting things that happened on your project and, you know, encourage them to, to respond and have that interaction. Um, some organizations, like ugh, we've mentioned Library of Virginia with the data stuff, but they they actually have a whole team that that does this. Um, they run transcribathons, like I think one in person and one virtual every month. And then once a year, they actually invite all their transcribers on site and like give them cake and show them source documents and you know really try to to make them part of the Library of Virginia community, which is kind of a fun. And I, and I think that most most organizations that we talk with are receptive to this because most cultural heritage organizations do have volunteer programs, right? They have good relationships with their volunteers and this applies whether they're public libraries or museums or, or research institutes. Um, but oftentimes those volunteers only have access to the, the work in the community while they're on site. And so we see a lot of success with blended programs in which um, someone is only able to get transportation two days a week to come to the state archives. Well, once they're home, they if they have a volunteer, uh, sorry, an opportunity to do remote volunteering, uh, that can be a real positive, right? You think about people who are caregivers or who have mobility issues or they're in remote locations and they can't get to Lexington or they can't or get to the Or they're city. expats, right? They, they're they from Kentucky, but now they live someplace else. and and But they still have that very strong association. And, and that's a way to kind of involve them in the community in the material. And uh, it, it's really powerful to see. Wanted to, to bring back uh, a comment that you made um, at the outset of your presentation, Ben, about um, digital sustainability, right? And and seeing what happens when um, uh, it, it, the, the countless hours um, of staff labor that had gone into the production of uh, a project like First American West uh, seems to disappear at, uh, at the blink of an eye. I know projects are thinking more now about sustainability and quite frankly, federal funders are asking those questions as well um, and, and justifiably so. Um, what are some of the tools now for digital sustainability and the questions, uh, those project design questions that people are asking? So I'd say that the biggest tool is awareness of the problem and attention by funders and managers. Uh, I think that there was a period maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago when these digital history projects had moved out of the experimental phase into the kind of gung-ho phase. Um, but that kind of resulted in a lot of uh, abandoned bespoke, projects yeah. or bespoke projects. So I'm gonna interrupt here. I don't think those are the most important things. I think that awareness is useful. Mm -hmm. And then there are tools that you combine with that, right? And those tools are technical standards. We are very, very big proponent of technical standards. We try to bring that to the digital humanities world as, as much as we can. Um, it was interesting, like, the text in, in the Wayback Machine or the, the Library of Congress site was uh, SGML. I'm like, hmm, TI wasn't even around then. That's fascinating because like we <laughs> were like, okay, here's all the ways you can get your data out of from the page. And we support about 12 different formats because we want people to be able to get all of them out because we don't know which one's going to be the right one. Right, <laughs> right. right. Yes. Um, and so... Uh... I remember back in 2010, we were um, working with uh, special collections at Southwestern University uh, in Georgetown, Texas, which is just north of Boston, on a Mexican war diary. And the archivist running this, um, at, at one point, her assistant, who was a, a young woman who was very tech savvy, uh, mentioned to me very quietly that the archivist was silently going and printing out the web pages as they were being transcribed and binding them up and kind of sticking them on a shelf and oh you know she's like she rolled her eyes and said you know this is this is no, kind I, of terrible I think it's time but I now, print them out. <laughs> yes but, right. but but you know now here we are 12 years later and we've added um a, a pdf and printable export format and to a word export page format. because uh, yeah. we really think that you know, multimodal preservation is really important, right? There's a project as it is, 
Um, there's preserved snapshots of the project like you get with the Internet Archive, but there's also things like, yeah, maybe maybe coming up with a big printout and, and sticking it on a, on a shelf might improve usability in 100 years in ways that we can't predict for any of these other things. Yeah. Well, and, and you talked about the role of, of funders in, in supporting and demanding these, these sorts of standards and addressing these in applications. Um, given that the NEH has supported this project um, and and the fact that you know we have worked together um, for a long time on on federally funded projects and melon funded projects what are the roles of these these sort of large uh, national funding bodies that that are really convening international conversations um, and and sort of putting uh, folks who are doing this type of work um together and you know how how are those conversations sort of driving this entire field forward yeah, I, I think that, you know, entities like the NEH or NHPRC um, have a challenge because on the, the one hand, those that have focused on the digital versions of historical research or literary research have been trying to promote innovation, and, and rightly so. Um, but at the same time, they also have been, especially recently, been trying to promote sustainability. And sustainability involves things like use common tools rather than building a new one from scratch, use standards rather than inventing a new one. But um, you know yeah. what? I'm seeing a lot of other um, conversations starting to happen. Um, there's practices that we do as software engineers, as product builders, um, customer interviews um, is, is one where you're like, okay, let's go talk to the people who are going to use this so we can figure out whether what we're building actually makes sense before we build it. Um, and I was really surprised to be on a call with, with a, a, a programs officer and, and he said, oh, we're asking people to actually go interview their potential users before they start building anything. I'm like, that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> and that's what you need to be doing. Um, so I love seeing that. So they're, they're part of their job is this cross pollination. Right. And we feel like that's part of, of what we try to do as well. We bring kind of our technical expertise, but our organizational expertise and our transcription and crowdsourcing, and we try to pull it all together in a way that can move people forward without them having to learn everything from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that that cross pollination um, is is absolutely critical, and that that led to the the success of this program. Um, and we look forward to getting that next next batch of uh, Filson documents up on from the page and letting folks uh, dive in and start transcribing there. And then looking forward by the end of the year to pulling all of that over into our Mecca site um for uh for a new presentation of this project that has been uh dark uh for over five years now um that's all the time we have for tonight uh thank you both for joining us and giving us this overview it was an absolute pleasure um, as always, I know in our audience, our live audience, we've got some folks who work at uh, some cultural organizations um, in the state. Uh, please get in touch um, with me or with the Brumfields if you have any other questions. I'm happy to, uh, to cross pollinate. Thank you both. Thank you. Our pleasure. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>